So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Christopher Springate. I'm, I work for DW News as a news anchor, um, and I'm going to be hosting you this afternoon um, for this uh, panel, uh, Closing the Digital Gender Gap, jointly hosted by the organizations um, who form gender at International Bonn. Um, we're all hosting this, um, uh, this, uh, this event. Um, let me just quickly, since you see four uh, wonderful panelists in front of you, let me just tell you who they are. We're going to be getting uh, a whole number of perspectives in this panel. For instance, the perspective of international decision makers. So we have uh, Jay Ajiwatram from UN Women. She is the lead digital and uh, interactive media specialist at UN Women. She's a key figure uh, in uh, UN Women's campaigns to raise awareness um, on gender equality. Thank you very much for being with us, uh, Jaya. Um, <laughs> we have a practical perspective as well, um, sort of a grassroots perspective from uh, Susanti Bunadi uh, from Indonesia, who works for GIZ, Germany's technical cooperation in Indonesia, uh, and has a lot of practical experience, knows the ins and outs of implementing uh, uh, these um, wonderful policies and, and, and principles that we uh, talk about um, on the ground. We have, um, um, we, we, perhaps we can have a, a round of applause at the end when I've when I finished everybody, <laughs> otherwise it'll just take too long. From Tanzania, we have sort of a no-nonsense um, media uh, uh, perspective, Carolyn Dorsey. Um, who um, is a journalist, she's a coach, she's a social media influencer, um, and the uh, co-founder of two key organizations for women in her country. I'm going to try and pronounce it pr uh, correctly. Mama Endeleo. Mama Endeleo. Mama, ma Mama Endeleo Mama Foundation. And I've been practicing that uh, for a while, but uh, obviously it didn't, didn't, uh, didn't work. Uh, the, la the Launchpad is the other organization that you uh, co-founded, so um, good to have you with us. And we also have uh, here from uh, North Rhine-Westphalia the um, perspective of a, of a regional policymaker, a regional administrator, Kwadula Atamaya, who is an administrative lawyer working for the state government of North Rhine-Westphalia. Um, and she is the head of digital society and media competen competency at uh, the uh, government, state government of NRV, NRW. So now you can applaud them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Now, um, this panel is about participation uh, in many ways, or at least partly about participation. So the thinking is that we're going to start with some audience participation straight away. You thought you were just going to come here and sit back and relax and listen to the wonderful panelists that I have for you, but we're going to start straight away with some work for you, although it's not that difficult. Um, we're going to do a live poll uh, and sample your opinions on this particular issue. Um, for that, you need um, something that many women around the world don't have, a mobile phone. Um, and um, also the digital literacy to use um, the app, the GMF app. Have you all downloaded the, the app? Okay, those of you who, who haven't downloaded it, don't worry, we can use the um, old school methods of just using our arms. Um, but if those of you who have downloaded the app, if you could then uh, just uh, click it open. Um, and if you go on menu, I'm gonna take you through this. Uh, like the blind leading the blind. Um, so once you've hit the menu, you get this kind of... Can you see that? You get the... Then hit program. It'll give you today's program, Monday the 11th of June. And if you scroll down to about 4 p.m., you should find uh, closing the digital gap under the number 14. Have you all got that? Yeah, and then you just uh, click on that, and you should, apart from the date, the time, the room, and the category, have at the bottom an icon that says voting. Are you all with me? Yes? Am I going too slowly? You're one of these digital uh, natives, aren't you? <laughs> okay, if you click on the voting, we have three questions for you, um, and... We will reveal the right answers uh, in, in a little while, but um, 
The first question is, you'll, you'll be seeing it on your phones, compared to men, how many women have access to the internet worldwide? Answer A is 120 million fewer, answer B, 50 million, answer C, 250 million. So if you just choose one of those answers, and then once you've done that, it'll show you you've done it, and then you go to the next question. Is everybody with me? Uh, no. Uh, no, not yet? Uh -huh, you, haven't, you haven't got a... Okay. So how many people, I want a show of hands, how many people have the voting icon and how many people don't? So first, the, with, the, with the icon? Oh, that's not too bad. And h how many people don't have the icon? Okay, so you're the digital immigrants and the others were the digital natives, okay? What I would suggest, what I would suggest, those of you who haven't got the icon, just find someone near to you who has the icon and then you can follow what's going on. We also have it up here on the screen so that you can see what's going on. So that was the first question. I personally went for answer C. I'm now on to the second question. Are you ready for the second question? Results. So the second question, in low and middle income countries, how many women own a mobile fan, uh, phone in comparison to men? Mrs. Springer. Mrs. Springer. <laughs> Is it? So, yeah. Um, after the first question, then directly from the results. Oh, right. We're yeah. going to get the results yeah, for this? Yeah. I am told exclusively that we're going to have the results for the first question first, so let's have a look this is second. at the results. So you can see the clock is uh, clocking away in the top right. And okay, so 55% of you said 250, and that is in, in fact correct. Uh, the uh, International Telecommunications Union, ITU, estimates uh, something like 250 million fewer women um, are online compared to men. So that's one measure of the digital uh, gender gap at the moment. I've just lost my second question. No, there it is. Okay, second question. In low and middle income countries, how many women own a mobile phone in comparison to men? Is it 350 million fewer? Is it 184 million fewer or 92 million fewer? So I'm going to give my answer. Has everybody clicked one of those three options? Yeah? Then let's see what the results are for that one. Okay, most of you said 370 million. It is, in fact, 184 million. That's according to uh, GSMA's Mobile Gender Gap Report 2018. Uh, on average, 10% um, fewer women are likely to own a mobile phone, and that translates to 184 million fewer women, another indication of the uh, gender gap. Has any, anybody got all the questions, the, the, the correct answers so far? Okay, gentlemen over there, two gentlemen. I, I have a feeling that the women are being modest in this room. <laughs> You got it right as well, okay. Question three. How many jobs in the digital sector are occupied by women globally? So the digital sector on the global um, scale, um, how many jobs in that sector are occupied by women? A, 37%, B, 11%, C, 24%. I'm going, I've done my, my answer. Everybody good? Let's have a look at the results. Okay, that's very interesting. So, 64% um, of you think 11%. It is, in fact, 24%. So, one in four, one in four of the jobs in the digital sector um, are occupied by women, and the other three quarters by men. Thank you very much for being our guinea pigs on this uh, live poll. It was exciting for me. I hope it was exciting for you. Um, and, yeah, I mean, basically, that gives us an idea of the, the gap. 
Um, 250 million fewer women online, 184 million fewer women owning mobile phones, and um, just one in four jobs in the uh, digital sector uh, held down by women. Before we get into the detail of why that is, how that's come about, um, our discussion, I'm going to invite our four panelists to give us a lightning talk, each of them a lightning talk. It really will be a lightning talk, two minutes each, and I will be, I, I've promised to be a diplomatic timekeeper, but a firm timekeeper. Um, so, uh, and Susanti um, Bunadi has been so kind as to start us off, and then we'll just go down the, the row here. So, Susanti. The Thank stage you. is yours. Thank you so much. So probably I will start with the um, situations in Indonesia as a background. So according to the data in 2017, actually the number of internet penetration in Indonesia already reached 143 million, which means it is uh, half of the Indonesia populations. And it is dominated by young adults, which means um, uh, the age around 19 until 34, almost 50%. And from, in terms of gender, it is also quite balanced. So uh, there are 48% are female users. However, despite uh, the high uh, penetration rate, I mean, Indonesia is one of the highest penetration rates in uh, Southeast Asia. However, the digital literacy of women is quite low. And there is a study mentioning from Accenture um, that only two-thirds, uh, Two-thirds of uh, women in Indonesia actually use internet only for social purpose. Actually, this is uh, unfortunate because e-commerce is currently very in in Indonesia and digitalization is unavoidable in major cities like Jakarta. And people just go online shopping and uh, online, um, yeah, order online transportation. Uh, do online banking, and there has been a phenomenon that um, the big conventional department stores are closing, and they have to survive. They have to um, have a new strategy, having an online platform. So uh, this means that company need uh, not only a strategy uh, for, uh, to survive, uh, but also they need skilled people. Uh, that uh, which is able to deal with the ICT. Okay, that, that was a, a, a lightning talk of about, I reckon, about a minute. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> Cordula Atamaya. Yes, then I get three minutes. Ah. Yes. <laughs> you, ha you have to negotiate with Susanti. <laughs> okay. Um, if you came here by train, you will have noticed that most people are staring at their smartphone men and women equally. So you might wonder, is the digital gap really an issue in Germany? And yes, you are right. In Germany, uh, the basic access to digital technologies is not the problem we are talking about today. But as often in life, things get complicated when you look at them more closely. Today in Germany, women are often higher educated than men, Female-owned startups are more likely to be successful. The question is, why don't they access the jobs that thrive best in the digital age? Studies also show that diverse teams have the best results in solving problems. This is what we require, teams of people that can find new creative approaches. So there's, in fact, a huge challenge that we face in Germany. What we need is no less than a change of culture. And that is not even a first world problem. The inclusion of women and beyond that diversity is a key to social and economic stability. Are there still stereotypes Women care for kids, men for computers. Women may be communicators, but men are leaders. What kind of framing is creating our reality? And how do you change a culture? Even as a policymaker, you cannot enact that by law. 
Luckily, the digital age is uh, already helping us with this. Um, with the possibility of mobile working, women and men have better opportunities of combining career and family. German governments, federal and regional, support numerous initiatives in gender issues that range from defined proportions of women in leading positions to promotion days for girls and for boys. And very important, there are a lot of activities to provide the digital literacy that everyone, not only women, need to fully benefit from digitalization. Awards like the Grimme Prize or the Grimme Online Award help to spread best practice. Women's networks in Germany give impulses and enhance debates. On Twitter and Instagram platforms like Edition F or Mädelsabende may become influencer for gender topics. Does this help to promote new role models for a digital society? So, even if in German trains most people look in their smartphones already, there's still a lot of work ahead of us to really close the digital gap. Okay, thank you, Cordula. Yes. And may I add, I was on a train yesterday um, from Cologne to Bonn, and just across me there was a teenager, a, a, a young woman, uh, and I, the, the corridor was so narrow I could see what she was doing, and she was having three WhatsApp con conversations at the same time. And uh, you know the teenagers, uh, the, our, our index fingers, like my generation, used to be the strongest fingers, but these days it's the teenagers, it's their thumbs. <laughs> And, um, and I know that her literacy was higher than mine, because I could never have three conversations at the same time. <laughs> Which brings us to Jaya from UN Women. Thank you. Um, so I want everyone here to raise their phones in the air, like right now. Okay, I'm presuming most of you have smartphones. Um, I want you to appreciate that phone, because that phone is not 10 or 20, but millions of times more powerful than the processing power, the combined processing power that NASA used to navigate humans to the moon and back. Right? Um, just think about that. Uh, technology is moving and evolving at a velocity unlike any other industrial revolution before us. But to the, you know, um, to the uh, woman in a drought-stricken village in sub-Saharan Africa, to the market vendor in Asia Pacific, along with billions of others who either don't have access to the internet, a phone, um, or even electricity for that matter, this revolution that we're seeing may as well not exist to them. And for those who do have access, the women and girls who do have access, they have economic, political, and uh, s structural barriers against them that prevent them from maximizing on the transformative powers of, um, of technology. And this includes um, barriers like digital literacy, uh, workplace policies that push women out of the talent pipeline, and much, much more. Um, so you're here today because you also want to hear how this change can happen, right? And if we are to seriously tackle this digital gender divide, we need a holistic and integrated approach. And this is something I, you know, we, I do definitely want to talk about as we enter um, the panel discussion. Um, and we need consistent investment across all sectors too. This means a combination of legal reform, bold government policies, um, investments in um, sex disaggregated data, um, uh, programs in attitudinal and digital uh, literacy, and much more. Above all, it needs a driver, and that is political will. Someone who's willing to, um, to take charge, um, is not unafraid to shake up business as usual, and also back that up with investments. Okay, Two thank minutes. you. <laughs> yeah, uh, collectively you're doing pretty good. Um, uh, Carol, you have 24 seconds left. <laughs> That is not fair. And being um, the human rights uh, uh, advocate that I am, I will protest. <laughs> uh, but thank you, uh, Chris, and thank you, 
uh, to the rest of the panelists. And thank you for showing up, because I was here before the, um, before the other panel ended, and it was a lesser turnout. So thank you to everyone who showed up to this one. Uh, it just goes to show how much uh, efforts are going into closing the digital gender gap. So in Tanzania, as we try to close it, there are four things that we're really focusing on to really promote digital literacy and digital citizenship amongst women, but overall digital inclusion. And with us, there are four challenges that we keep on repeating in everything that we do, which is accessibility, affordability, appetite, and availability. So one, do women have the access to digital infrastructure to digital technology? The answer is no. The Tanzania Communications uh, Regulatory Authority um, released uh, data, I think, two months ago, saying that right now at Tanzania we had 23% um, internet penetration. Um, how many of them are women, we are yet to find out. But we know that from the groundwork that we do, uh, the percent could be less than 30%. But also when you look at the issue of affordability and how many women can afford uh, being included in the digital world, not just through laptops or computers, but not through smartphones like the ones that we have here, but just through simple feature phones that are very much uh, available in, in my country. Um, there's also the issue of availability of the network. Even if they can afford it, if they can afford the phone, how many of them live in areas where uh, the digital infrastructure is there? So that is also one of the major challenges as we try to close the gap. But there's also the issue of appetite, which goes down to local content, and which goes down to really producing content um, that would resonate with these women. Most of our women are in the informal economy, and the ones who are in the rural, I mean, in the urban areas are the ones who also uh, very much <laughs> Uh, opt for Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram. And as we advocate for digital inclusion, we're saying that it's not, as much as we're saying it's for social use and social media is for social use, but we should really try to embrace or encourage women to embrace other means and other alternatives and other advantages they can get from being digital citizens. So those are the four challenges that we're dealing with. But then at the same time, as we promote and as we encourage them to get online, um, to be included in the digital world and be digital citizens, there's also the issue of online and cyberbullying, um, cyberbullying and cybermobbing, which is a big issue back at home, especially for women like us who are vocal, uh, who are not um, afraid to stand up and will speak up against whatever that is happening in the country. So sometimes it's actually organized um, attacks as soon as you are vocal, uh, you would find a group of people coming after you on all your social media platforms and just really trying to get you down. So it's, it's an ongoing process. It's definitely um, uh, challenging, but we are really trying to do what we can. And there are a few initiatives on the ground uh, that are ongoing. And as we focus on digital skills and digital literacy for women, we're also trying to equip them with one, the confidence, uh, just encourage them to have the confidence and really to have the resilience to withstand whatever that they will come across on social media, but also focus very much on netiquette and digital citizenship and say, these are the do's and don'ts. And it really has to come from you. So offline mirroring online should go hand in hand. I hope I did 24 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, no, no comment. Uh, but we're, we're wonderfully on time. Thank you so much for, for being disciplined and uh, giving us a, a, um, a quick sort of spotlight from, from these four different perspectives. Uh, I just want to say, so I'm, I'm going to start asking some questions, but please um, jump in. If you have a question, just um, wave or put your hand up or stand up. Um, uh, the only thing I would ask you is also always to say your name and perhaps if it's relevant who you work for and then your question or uh, there may be also contributions that you have. So don't be shy. I'd also like to join Carol and, 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 and say thank you also for being so numerous uh, and particular thank you to all the men who are here because um, I think it's always wrong to view women's problems as just women's problems. Uh, so it's good to have uh, men here as well. Um, let me kick off. Um, so we, we, we've established um, the, the digital um, uh, gender gap. Um, you know, some of, some of the figures uh, I had, you know, 250 million fewer women online and so on. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask all of you, um, 
Where does that gap come from? What is the main cause, the main source of, of that digital um, gap? Um, Jaya, do you want to start? Sure. Um, well, I wanted to start off by saying there is no one main cause. Um, it comes from... Um, <coughs> sorry. Bless you. It comes from... Um, <laughs> multiple um, problems that we that have always existed in terms of existing inequalities in the physical world in our structural um, economic and political systems that are just manifesting themselves in the digital world that we see right and um, and so I, it does go well beyond uh, um, access to the technology and affordability to the technology. And I would say one of the biggest um, problems is uh, the discrimi discriminatory norms and stereotypes and biases that exist that are so pervasive in society um, that also um, prevent women from um, using the technology and accessing that technology. So uh, to give you an example, there's a, there's a study um, that shows that already by the age of six, uh, girls are um, likely to perceive their gender as not as smart and, um, and, and to not engage in, quote, intelligent um, activities. And so when it comes to careers or even subject matters to do with science, technology, engineering, and math, they're not enrolling. And you see that in numbers in terms of enrollment rates um, in, in university. Yeah. OK. Ka Carol, do you want to pick up? Um, I definitely agree with what um, Jaya said. And you see, with us in, in sub-Saharan Africa, it's even worse. If you look at the male-dominated system, it's even worse. But even in the education system, um, the enrollment right now with the free universal education, we have free education all the way up to high school, I mean, secondary school. But even when you look at the enrollment, it's, it's really disappointing and discouraging because the girls that get enrolled in school are not the ones who graduate by the time they reach secondary school. And we have a huge problem right now um, with te teenage pregnancy in Tanzania. There was a region in Tabora, um, a, a Tabora region, we had 18,000 teenage pregnancies reported in less than three months. This is in one region alone. So it, it's definitely systematic, it's definitely societal. But it's also the environment that we have subjected our girls to. Um, poverty, of course, is the underlying factor for us in everything. So as we focus on that, we really have to look at economic empowerment as well. Really empowering women to have the, the decision-making um, environment so that they can really be part of it, but also an enabling environment so that they know that they're able to do this, but also encourage them to, to be or to lean towards more, uh, lean towards um, STEM um, um, subjects, which is also something that I've seen um, uh, Germany try to do. I was with the ministry uh, last week, uh, the Ministry of Digital Infrastructure, and it's amazing the, the plans and the initiatives that are ongoing. And I, I, I have a lot of takeaways, but I'm also struggling with how now to go back home and say this is how we can implement it considering the structures that are already in place and the policies that are already in place. So it's a lot of work. Okay, we'll, we'll get to, to sort of some of the approaches and solutions in a second. Just, uh, is everybody uh, familiar with STEM? As it, I think STEM is sort of science, science uh, technology. technology. And mathematics. Yeah, exactly. So the, the technical subject. Yes. Yeah. Um, Indonesia, what, what's the situation there? What are the, the, the main sort of factors that are hindering access for, for women to ICTs? Yes, actually, um, in our project, why we chose that uh, gender approach in women in science and technology, because uh, this, in the schools that we supported, there are like 15 schools we supported, there were only like 20% uh, women in the STEM subjects, and that's why uh, I think it is very important to support a more uh, women, um, and then after that, that we conducted girls innovation camp, uh, a three days camp, uh, to raise awareness on the uh, the, the importance of uh, female um, students' participation in maximizing technology and innovations. And then before uh, the event, we conducted a drawing test. So we would like to see uh, about the perceptions of the students and as well as the teachers at that time, and then. Uh, I, uh, we told them to draw uh, some professions. And then still there, has, uh, there, there is still this association that, for example, engineers 
there are a male, they draw uh, male engineers and female nurses. So still uh, the stereotyping is there. And then as we conducted interview, because we want to have some kind of monitoring and evaluations, and uh, there is a teacher, there was a teacher saying, a male teacher saying that coding is a male thing because women are, uh, tend to be more emotional and men are rational. So this is uh, still happening. And isn't that true? I mean, I'm very no, rational. No, after, uh, <laughs> Excuse mean, me. <laughs> after the camp, then uh, the girls realized. And then, you know, uh, at the very first time, I only, uh, this is also a gender issues that only um, female teachers would like to attend uh, in the event. And uh, we said, no, uh, we need male voices. We need support from male teachers so that the male teachers also realize that the girls also can do that. So, yes, and then finally there were three teachers joining our event. <laughs> and then at, finally they realized, so mm -hmm. the girls could do that. May I just point out, I didn't study sciences. I'm a very <laughs> irrational person. Um, what, what I'm getting from, from your answers, I'm, I'm coming to you in a second, Cordula, is, is that um, it's the, the, the stereotypes that are really getting in the way. Uh, the, the stereotype visions of what a woman's role is and what a man's role is, and, that, and that's a major cause of the digital uh, gender gap. And also, Carol, from you, um, the, simply the cost of the technology in uh, low-income, middle-income countries. Would that be roughly accurate? Cordula, um, from the German perspective, um, you know, one of the richest countries in the world, how does that resonate with you? Um, I want to begin with, uh, it is not um, technical infrastructure, it is not uh, technical devices, um, I think. Um, it's quite interesting uh, what you have said, that um, coding uh, is uh, um, discussed to be male or female. Uh, as when I remember exactly, I think um, uh, Programmierer uh, uh, was at the beginning a typical female job, and um, it became male. It's, I think it's quite interesting that uh, it, uh, can, at the beginning it was something that is very important for digitalization. It was really typical female and it, it changed. And um, maybe it's necessary that it's changing again. Um, therefore, maybe it's one point that um, the right education uh, for the um, for the needs that uh, male or female or other diverse groups have is really an important topic that uh, is um, discussed in Germany um, very intense nowadays. That's really, I think, an important matter that uh, we're still a way to go. And um, on the other hand, I think that what I said in the Lightning talk, um, that there are stereotypes, that's a matter of uh, culture, of framing. There are um, not so many facts that are really objective. Uh, maybe there might be a way, and therefore it, uh, um, uh, it's more uh, sociological, maybe psycholo psychological factor that we have to do it. Um, to my point of view, maybe it would be interesting when uh, there would be more awareness that um, women in uh, the digital sector are really economic. That's interesting to, that they uh, would be uh, there because of the lack of uh, skilled workers. Uh, there is a lot of chance that, uh, um, um, that are still there, and I think... Um, Maybe the economy is not um, as aware of that um, as necessary. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of that film. Maybe you can help me. Was it Hidden Figures? Um, yes. Where, I mean, uh, for me, that was new, that a computer used to be a human being, mm -hmm. and usually a female mm -hmm. human being, yeah, indeed. Um, let me just, before we move on to sort of some approaches and solutions... Um, Again, you know, that we have a question right here. Let me just get a microphone to you. Do we have a microphone? Um, and you can project, but, you know, we have technology. <laughs> um, so, yeah, if you can just give us your name and sure, who you work for. Sure, my name is Krista Kapralis. I'm with Global Press Journal, and all of the reporters at our media organization are women who cover their own communities. 
And one thing that we find um, across the board is when we're particularly um, bringing on new reporters around the world, by and large, they express concern about the physical safety that they have when they have um, you know, our, our global press laptops, our global press you know, smartphones, whatever piece of technology that they have, and they express the concerns about the risks. So we, that's a big piece of, of what we do is making sure that they are safe. But by and large, it's been really interesting to see how much they're concerned about that. And so I'm wondering if any of you could talk about the connection between physical safety and digital um, capability, because I think that's very real for, for many of our reporters. Although they gladly take the risk, it's certainly an issue. OK, thank you for that question. Carol, weren't you talking about harassment? Uh, um, yes, uh, but nothing alongside theft. <laughs> OK. Uh, but definitely physical safety in terms of sometimes it really gets intense, the attacks um, towards women. And one has to wonder if it's going to you know, uh, get from online to offline. So it's definitely something that we consider. Um, and. We do have a couple of initiatives. For example, there's this um, safe space for women that we have back home being run by this amazing lady. And basically what it does is it creates this safe space for women to come and work um, and to feel safe to really engage in conversations that they can push for gender equality and gender um, inclusion. But as far as uh, the laptops getting snatched off or mobile phones, no, we're not there yet. Although we do have cases of spouses, uh, you know, getting their phones from their wives when perhaps they've pawned off theirs. You know, they go to the wife and they take uh, the, the wife's phone and whatnot. And um, it's very unfortunate, but it, especially in the rural areas, the women are the ones who own the phones because the women are the ones who, who the farmers and the women who are the ones who are in the mobile technology. We have this revolutionary mobile, um, mobile money technology called M-Pesa back home. So it's most of the women who are the farmers who you know, would own a phone just to, to make a transaction and whatnot. And the man, because most of them unfortunately um, indulge in extracurricular activities. So <laughs> they, <laughs> they find themselves um, most of the times losing their devices. And yeah, so. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 so I'm fascinating. If, if the women are doing all the farming, okay, um, most. mostly, no. what are the men doing? Why aren't they farming? Oh, right, okay. Okay. Uh, Jaya, I think you were about to contribute. Yeah, I definitely want to chime in here because that's a very, very important topic, the safety um, of a woman. And this actually applies to um, women across the world when it comes to the digital divide. Um, so uh, for women who are not getting access, um, it's, it's because of fear of their own uh, lives, right? Um, they, they could face violence for owning or even borrowing a phone. And, then, uh, and, and if they want to travel to a facility where there is technology, you'll find that they're also more prone to attacks. And again, this is depending on some countries that you're looking at. But it's not just a, um, an issue for one country. Now, if you take it to people who are then connected online, uh, you're facing harassment on social media, right? Um, or you're facing harassment in the workplace. And how do, and how do we retain talent when that's happening? So uh, if you look at um, uh, the tech industry, uh, sexual harassment um, it is really widespread. Um, and, uh, and if you look at within the EU, there's a study that was conducted. In the EU, 75% um, of women in leadership and senior management positions have experienced some form of sexual harassment in the workplace in their lifetime. So it, it happens in, in all stratas um, in society. And, and if, you know, if policymakers need to do anything, they also need to look at this particular angle um, and strengthen laws. Um, so that we can uh, address this, a woman can safely access technology. Okay, thank you. Um, perhaps we could move on um, to, to sort of some of the approaches uh, that are being taken uh, to reduce the, the gender gap. I mean, uh, I read uh, the other day that it has actually increased between the year 2013 and 2016, according to ITU. So, um, so what... what in, in, in your views, uh, feel free to grab a microphone. Um, are the, are the most promising approaches uh, that are that are already happening or that are planned uh, to deal with, you know, what you've been telling us—the the, the harassment problem, the safety problem, the cost problem, 
uh, the problem with the framing and, and the stereotypes. What are the approaches? Are there any silver bullets out there? So I had a presentation for this, I think, but, but we can just skip it over. It's, it's fine. No, it's okay. So we, we have a couple of um, initiatives, um, and some are even starting at the lowest uh, educational levels. We have um, this organization called Apps and Girls that teaches coding to girls in primary and secondary schools. Um, I personally work... work um, on training on digital skills through the Launchpad, uh, specifically for women. And it's, it's sort of like a, a tailor-made module just for women so that we can equip them, not just with the generic digital skills, but with how to protect yourself. So data privacy, how to respond to online bullying and whatnot. But that also um, it converges with the, what I do with Women at Web, which is under DW Academy as well. Uh, we are promoting digital literacy and digital citizenship um, amongst women. So by telling them that, one, don't be afraid to get online. Two, this is what you can get when you get online. Depending on what you do, it can um, translate to your personal and professional development. Uh, but also making them aware of the cyber uh, law the cybercrime law. So knowing your rights, but also knowing the do's and don'ts. And then when you do get attacked online, where do you go? What do you do? How do you share that experience? But also promoting sort of like and encouraging a support system amongst women because one of the things that we discovered is um, in most of these online attacks, perhaps it's because of the mentality that we've been brought up with, but it's some of it is actually coming from women. It's women attacking women. It's not even the men. So then we're saying, uh, we already have all this, you know, we already have a movement. We already have a fight. Why would, you want, why would you want to be on the other side? You should be on this side. Is that a generational thing? Uh, well, some people actually say that because if you spoke to my mom, she would say that doesn't exist. <laughs> you know, uh, but if I spoke, to, if I speak to my peers, it's something that we definitely share. Um, sometimes you would have maybe the more advanced, the more uh, vocal women attack the other women who are just upcoming, just because they fear, sh you know, sharing the spotlight. So it's it's really it's it's a bunch of con it's like a concoction of issues. But at the end of the day, we believe in digital literacy first, because when you are aware, when you know, you know. You know, it, it, it enables you, it empowers you. So translating that now to political and economic empowerment, which is what we're actually pushing for as well, is the direction that we're taking. Okay. Um, let, let me ask uh, Susanti. What, what, I, what I'm taking from what you're saying there is digital literacy, but also uh, a role model like yourself. I mean, if, if I was a digitally illiterate woman, you'd be inspiring me at the moment. <laughs> I, I don't know, so, what, so. What, what do you think? <laughs> would, would, would you agree with me? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And we actually call them... Oh, my mic is off. No, no, it's on. <laughs> oh, okay. So we actually call them on... Um, through Women at Web, we call them Woman A, Woman B, and Woman C. Mm -hmm. So I'm Woman C. And Woman A is the one who has no digital skills, no digital literacy. And what we're also trying to do is sort of like encourage a trickle-down effect, you know, to, for the Woman C to now influence the Woman A and really make it sort of like an ecosystem. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Sorry, Suzanne T, I got in the way. Uh, what, how, what, what approaches are you putting in place in Indonesia? Yes, I would like also to comment uh, Ms. At Atermeyers uh, in, in, in terms of preparing skilled workforce, which is very important for Indonesia. Right now, German government has a long-standing cooperation with uh, Indonesian government in strengthening vocational education and training. And then um, we, uh, and one of uh, our key approach is that uh, stronger involvement of private sector, which is uh, very crucial uh, because private sector is actually the end user of the, gra the graduates, right? And then uh, we ha uh, Indonesia has still has a problem of skills mismatch with 51% skill mismatch, which is quite high. And there is a study uh, from LinkedIn, which is a, a new study, which says that 22% uh, companies in Indonesia expect uh, the fresh graduates to be uh, digital literate, which is also um, a challenge for Indonesia, how to uh, prepare uh, the skilled workforce uh, which is needed by the private sector. That's why our uh, approach is, is um, we uh, put 
as we put uh, the focus on the stronger involvement of private sector, we conducted Girls Innovation Camp. It is a collaboration uh, between GIZ on behalf of German government and uh, Ministry of Education and Culture in Indonesia as well as Intel Indonesia. Because we think that um, without the, the active role of private sector, uh, there is a very, yeah, you, there's no use. I mean, because they are the user of the graduates. So it is very important for them uh, to support the female employees uh, as well as also the students. And through the event, like Girls Innovation Camp, they actually can share the philosophy on gender equality from the company, why actually um, they, uh, the company needs more women, uh, the role of uh, girls uh, in these issues, and it is also benefit for the students because they can learn and adapt the new technology from the company. So it serves as a, some kind of career guidance also for the students, so they can have a contact uh, with the company, so maybe uh, the company can issue a, a certificate of participation which is beneficial for them mm -hmm. uh, in the job application. So a win-win situation. Yes. You, increasing the skills levels of, of the workforce, using yeah. that as leverage to get yeah. the private sector involved. Yes, actually we involve uh, the private sector at the very beginning. That's mm. uh, the most ideal way. Is there any resistance there? Um, in Indonesia, yes, of course, uh, there are success stories, but of course there are challenges. Um, sometimes, you know, there are not, um, the schools, maybe they don't really, very, they are not very confident of, to approach the private sector and the, the private sector don't know about good schools. So we are, you know, in the middle, in SGIZ, we have to put them closer together. That's yeah. where you come in. Yes. You build the bridges. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, uh, Cordula, um, North Rhine-Westphalia, um, the biggest state in Germany. Some people call it a small country. Um, what, what are your approaches to, to closing the digital uh, gender divide? Um, as I already said, there are a lot of activities in context uh, digital literacy, and uh, not only for kids, but... Uh, as uh, on the aspect of lifelong learning uh, for um, the whole, um, for all. And uh, we uh, try to, um, to manage w which person has, which needs, uh, which person ha uses uh, um, devices for which purpose and which need is therefore um, necessary. Participation is uh, a topic uh, and participation um, um, is therefore um, very important not only f as a democratic system but as well uh, participation to be a part in the economic um, environment and um, I think maybe it's uh, uh, my filter bubble because of my job, but I think uh, um, if we uh, go on on this aspect, we um, we will come further, and maybe it will help us um, if we do not uh, only speak about gender, but uh, speak about diversity, and gender is one aspect in a diverse world. Maybe um, it would um, be easier. Um, uh, to avoid a uh, kind of gender war, because, uh, to my opinion, gender war does not help. Mm. Okay. Um, let me... You, you're being a very uh, uh, attentive audience, very well-behaved, but, you know, please do put your hands up and, and get involved if you want to. Um, uh, we have a question right here. Can we have um, a, uh, a microphone? Is, is the microphone on? Yeah. yeah. Yes, mine is a suggestion. Um, as founder of a community radio station in Ghana, I think we can use community radio stations to educate women on um, closing the digital gender gap. I say so because for community radio, um, language is not a problem. We speak the local language. And women feel free to phone in to express their views and all. So. 
it will be easier for them to identify with any such program that is put on community radio than um, focusing on the educated or elite women in the big cities and towns. So it is a suggestion that we can, we can look at. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. May I, Chris? Uh, take, um, take, yes, yeah? Carol, so and, then, I, and then we'll get your question. I absolutely agree with you, and it's one of the approaches that we are actually considering because, um, for example, when we look at our population, the largest uh, population um, of women who are not online are the ones that I said are in the rural areas, and how do we get to them by using the community radios? And we feel, well, I personally feel, that the role of the media is diminishing you know, especially in Tanzania, in promoting agendas like this. So it's definitely something that we really need to look at. Um, also in the aspect of what I was speaking about earlier, the appetite and creating this local content that would really encourage this woman to get online and say, yes, this is something that relates to me, you know. For example, we were saying um, do-it-yourself, you know, DIY videos. They can get on YouTube and you know, do these do-it-yourself do videos that would actually encourage other women to do all this amazing stuff. But then how do we get them to even do something like that? Or how do we get them to even go online and search for something like that? So it's definitely work in progress, and I absolutely agree with you 100%. Great suggestion from the audience. Thank you very much. We had a, a question at the back. Uh, no, in the middle. And do, do give us your name and who you work for. Uh, hello, my name is Jamila Abdullahi, and I run a, a website in Ghana called circumspect.com. And um, I think this, this topic is definitely of personal interest to me. I've been running my website for 10 years, and I've watched the numbers change over the years. Um, initially, it was very heavy with women being the core audience. And over time, it ended up being men. Men are about 56% of my audience, even though I'm an African woman and I talk about issues related to African women. So this is something that I've always wondered about and tried to experiment and explore. And most recently in March, uh, I did a series on sisterhood, women supporting women. You talked about how women are the ones who sometimes um, put other women in those tight spots. And we had an entire Facebook conversation series basically talking about being a contemporary African woman and so on. What was interesting to me was, and this is consistent across all the content I tend to put out, um, the men are the ones who will be vocal. Even if it's on w women's issues, it's the men who will be vocal. Um, so to test out why women were not being as vocal online, uh, we decided to organize pretty much the same thing, but take it offline. And in that space, we basically said it's a, it's a half day event. Um, we brought resource personnel. It, it was at a, uh, in a building or in, at a, with a company that is woman owned, woman run. And we didn't actually tell the men that they couldn't come. Although if they had, I would have told them the only thing is you listen and you don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what ended up happening was really beautiful because you had all of these women who normally wouldn't say a word online, but they found themselves in a space where they didn't feel judged, where they didn't feel like a random person would just get up and discredit who they are as individuals and where they didn't actually need to know how to use all of these in quotes complicated digital tools. Mm -hmm. All they needed to do was be there themselves. So I think there's um, a lot to be said about doing all of this, but always keeping in mind, how do you translate from online to offline? Especially in the context of Africa, right? Because we, we, we have all of these additional elements that kind of restrict our usage of the digital spaces. So it's moving from um, digital to non-digital, and then taking those insights back to digital. So it's creating that entire, um, that entire loop. Uh, the second thing is content, right? Yes, there's definitely information on YouTube, for example, a lot of information on YouTube. But as an African woman, if I go on YouTube, I'm gonna look around for a bit. I'm seeing things that are definitely the information I want, but I'm not seeing myself in it. Localization. Yes. Yeah. So localization of content is another big thing. And so I think even as we are creating all of these resources and apps and tools, there's a lot to be said about people being able to recognize or women being able to recognize themselves 
in those platforms, in that content, in those in those tools. So I think those are just two things that I've noticed that I thought I would I would put out there. Can I just ask you a quick question? Um, how did you grow your male audience? I didn't actually. Like I've never <laughs> I've never actually focused on my my audience is organic, right? For the most part. Um, I thought initially that maybe part of why I was getting a, a very male audience is because of some of the topics. So topics is another thing. Some of the topics that I address. So I'm an economist, so I talk a lot about economic development, some of the hard, in quotes, hard issues, which comes back to the question of women thinking they're not smart enough for certain topics or that they don't have the, the, the rights to talk about certain issues, really. I think that's what it also comes down to. So tying okay. it, it all... Very complicated stuff. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much for that contribution. I see there's someone. Yes, a round of applause for that. Um, b before you get going, we have just two minutes left, I'm afraid, um, and and I need to respect the panels that are coming after us. So, um, uh, if two eighty characters. <laughs> Or less. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be diplomatic about it. Um, so if you give us your question and then another question, we'll just gather those two questions to finish off the panel. Well, unfortunately, I'll disappoint and not have a question, but just wrap all this up by saying, first of all, my name is Nanjira Sambuli from the World Wide Web Foundation, and this is my daily headache globally. So what I just wanted to say based on what Carol and Jamila touched upon is we cannot talk about this without understanding that all these things are linked together by the patriarchal system that is trying to be disrupted both online and offline. You will not find women feeling confident to speak online, for instance, because the whole idea of how they speak up is already gendered in, in the sense that, you know, your place is to be this and that or the other. And so even for those of us who are working at, you know, knowing at this thing of different elements, we have to understand at the end of the day, that's the thing that brings us all together. Now to say that you're disrupting the patriarchy is not to say that you're making it a zero sum game. We're not saying we're gonna knock off all the men and take over the spaces, no. We're saying the system that has automatically placed men in this particular systems as, as the dominant, as the best person, as this, that, or the other, all of that is being challenged and the great opportunities that digital is helping us either fast track that or enhance the inequality. Okay, thank you very much. And um, a question or a contribution? Right here, and then we'll bring it back to the panel. Just a very quickly. short question. Susanne Nolden, a network gender, and international, gender at International Born and City of Born. I'd like to uh, raise the aspect of actual literacy. How would you address women who are not literate with online media and digital literacy, first? Secondly, um, is this a question of age? Would you say this is a question of age if people access to digital literacy or not? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, I'm going to ask you to d give lightning answers so that we maintain time discipline. Um, Suzanne, do you want to start us off? Oh. Okay. okay. Um, sorry. Um, so uh, I'll respond to the question of uh, literacy and age. So one, with literacy, uh, we, we're really trying. And with the universal education that we have, uh, although they're not very advanced, but reading and writing is something that is very, well, most of them have. So with us, even with the approaches that we're using, uh, when we're training digital skills, we tailor more the module uh, to, to accommodate uh, these women from different uh, backgrounds. So even when we're preparing our training materials, we have to do a survey and use a human-centered design and figure out what would resonate with this woman, what would be more appealing to her, but what would be more accessible to her. Um, on the question of age, in Tanzania, we have 44% of the population under 20. So we look at, yeah, 44% of the population, 19% of the population, no, 44% under 15 and 19 percent under 20. So you can imagine if we do it right then we're really going to bring the digital revolution not just from the grassroots level but all the way it will be a cross-cutting cross-cutting issue. So we're very excited about it and that is why we're really putting more efforts into the education system. We hope someday we will get to Germany's level and have a dual system where we will have vocational, you know, and academic complement each other. Uh, but in the meantime, we are very hopeful that if we get, if we catch them early um, and promote the lifelong learning um, amongst the youth, uh, the, the majority of the population, then we're going to get there. Okay, thank you. So literacy is a huge problem, and this takes us back to why we need to invest uh, more in, edu in, in education and also 
uh, to look at the barriers that prevent um, both women and girls from getting the education that they need. So um, to throw another statistic out there <laughs> for you, um, it, it'll take, uh, if we c continue going at the pace that we're going right now, it'll take 95 years to close uh, the, 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 uh, the parity gap that we have right now, oh, sorry, to achieve parity, sorry, and lower secondary school education for the world's poorest 20%. Right? And so um, if we are to look at the problem, we have to look at it holistically. Um, and, um, and it means like looking at it from the younger age going up into the older age ca uh, category. For women who, um, who missed out on the educational opportunities at a younger age, um, governments also need to look at uh, that angle, right, and all the other um, sectors need to look at how we can introduce programs to um, to get women uh, not only literate, um, uh, but also actively using the transform, you know, the, the actual apps that are relevant to them that could help their lives. Um, I think tech companies can also help by um, by by rethinking the interface uh, of how they create their phones, yeah. so that it uh, it does help with, um, with people who are illiterate um, to be able to access information on the internet. Cordula? I think age is one aspect, but it's uh, um, only one. And uh, I think uh, um, sometimes it's too quickly to say the young um, uh, do this and uh, the old one do that. Um, um, or male and female contrast. Um, I think uh, often it's an, an aspect of how open-minded uh, people are or uh, in, in which kind of atmosphere they want to live if they are shy or if they are afraid. And uh, there are a lot of aspects and um, uh, I think it's, um, we, will do, we will not really do the, the necessary things if we only um, check uh, such categories. And uh, uh, sometimes I think it's really hard when we uh, think about uh, the youngest, the, uh, the children that are go, uh, going to school, and uh, then we um, have a big jump and uh, we are with the seniors. And uh, the, the, the big part of, uh, of people creating the world uh, right now uh, are in the middle, I think. And um, it, I think it's very uh, important that we um, um, use a lot of uh, possibilities uh, to become better in that place and that we, as it was said, uh, combine offline and online and uh, think about it. And uh, in Germany, a uh, discussion that is ongoing is the, um, the idea, um, or especially in author is failure, um, of creating third places, use places that are uh, good for, um, for discussion and education, uh, for example, uh, as places we knew uh, as a library. And I think we ha have to be creative to, uh, to find such places to, uh, to come into contact, to discuss and um, uh, uh, to educate at the same time. Okay, thank you. Protected spaces, perhaps. Um, Susanti, last but not least. Yeah, I think um, we should start early. Um, probably integrating digital lit literacy starting from the primary, primary schools and the government of Indonesia has already integrated coding uh, in the vocational educations. And I think vocational education and training here can offer uh, possibilities for those who, for example, are not enrolled in formal schools, but also in the inform uh, offers uh, informal courses, um, for example, like uh, online uh, e-commerce training and everything. So I think it is uh, also possible um, done by the vocational training. Okay, Susanti, Koruna, Jaya, Carol, many, many thanks. Absolutely fascinating. And please view this as a, as a platform to continue your discussions with uh, these wonderful panelists. And could you give them a round of applause?